And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Put that thing back where it came from or so help me. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction. Wait, is this the Halloween episode? <laughs> it's the uh, October Scary Story <laughs> event episode, yeah? Okay. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, page 71. I am your host, Rish Outfield. And I am your host, Big Anglovich. And here in the studio is R-O-8-O-T. And with us as always... Announcer Man. We were talking like this, Announcer Man. Put something into it. No. <sighs> okay. Apparently Fine. He's shown us the error of our ways. <laughs> we have a double episode for you today, or, or two stories at least. I don't know if it's a double episode. It is a little bloated. <laughs> um, I've had some beans earlier, and that's that's the problem. You'll be experiencing that as time moves on. <laughs> so the first story we're presenting tonight is the winner of our October Scary Story event. Pretty timely, folks. <laughs> it is All on St. Mark's Eve by Rick Kennett, who is our Australian writer. And I believe this is the third story he's done for us, which means we will never accept a story from him again. Yeah, uh, we already actually have another one of his coming down the pipe. Oh, you'll have at least four. Okay, well, is it too late to uh, cancel that last story? Oh, oh wait, OT? Yeah, he says it's too late. Sorry. Oh. Well, I'm sure the next one will be great, too. Oh, embarrassing. Huh? About the author. Rick Kennett, you may remember, lives in Melbourne. Melbourne? How do they say that? They say Melbourne. Thank you. Bruce? Think nothing of it, Bruce. Australia, Australia, <laughs> Australia. We, we love, love you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, apparently he lives in Melbourne. Yes, and he works as the world's longest-serving motorcycle courier. Oh. I bet you didn't even know they still existed. Didn't care, actually, but oh, yes, that's, <laughs> All right. that's amazing. Well, well, there you go. To find out more about Rick and his projects, you can check out his website with the link in the show notes. Special thanks to Julie Hoverson for lending her voice to this story. And the music is by Roger Subirana. All on St. Mark's Eve, by Rick Kennett. In the middle of the 19th century, divorce was a social stigma. Messy, complicated, and above all, expensive. Murder was easier. At least so it seemed to Mrs. Catherine Baxter, the young and attractive wife of an elderly retired merchant. Lively and vivacious, and with a love of dancing in the theater, she felt eternally chained by her husband's reclusive nature and recurring illnesses. Rumor about the village had it that she had only married him for his money. If that was so, Catherine had been terribly short-changed. That they did not seem to have much in common was plain enough, and their arguments were both numerous and raucous. Her few nights out, always taken alone, and on nights her husband fell asleep early through exhaustion and illness, she thought of as escapes. It was during one of these escapes to a country ball that she met a good-looking doctor of her own age by the name of Henderson. Gossip soon whispered of clandestine meetings with his young doctor, and how Mrs. Baxter was longing, more than ever now, for her husband's death. The sight and sound, and particularly the smell of old Baxter when sick, nauseated and infuriated her. His pallor, his hacking cough, his constant bedridden condition, and perpetual drinking of medicines and swallowing of pills— whether the idea of murder first occurred to Catherine or to her paramour, later neither could remember. Putting the thought into action, she persuaded her ailing husband to give up his own doctor on the pretext that he was not doing him any good, and consult her medical lover. 
So Dr. Henderson, smiling kindly Dr. Henderson, became Baxter's new physician, coming every day in his sulky, with files and seething mixtures so strangely different to the medicines administered by his predecessor. Not long after this, Mr. Baxter steadily grew more ill, growing paler and weaker. Indeed, the servants in the house implored Mrs. Baxter to reinstate the original doctor, but she would not hear of it. They also noticed that the worse the master became, the more cheerful was Mrs. Baxter's demeanor. By now, the two lovers had grown less circumspect and were openly socializing with each other at dances, the theater, and glamorous parties. One evening, while attending a soiree given by the fashionable and somewhat bizarre Mrs. Salisbury, their hostess, dressed in silks of red and yellow, approached, and with a cryptic smile and a nod said, The 24th of April is at hand, my dear, the eve of St. Mark's. Indeed, said Catherine, politely, but exchanged puzzled glances with her partner, the doctor, for... Neither understood to what she referred. Ah, the younger generation's neglect of tradition. Mrs. Salisbury sighed, realizing the problem. When I was a girl, it was quite the thing on the eve of St. Mark's for those with nerves strong enough to watch at the midnight hour on the porch of the church. Watch for what? asked Dr. Henderson. For the phantasms of those of the parish destined to die over the following twelve months. And does the village make an outing of it? Oh, no. No one from the village goes near the church on the eve of St. Mark's. None but the old believe in the silly superstition, and the old won't go for fear of what they might see. She gave Catherine Baxter a wink. But it would be a curious experience if a death were expected, would it not? And with that, she was gone in a whirl of red and yellow to dispense pearls of unlooked-for wisdom among her other party guests, leaving Dr. Henderson and his lady to once more exchange glances. But this time, the glances were speculative, for now their thoughts were filling with a wild surmise. On St. Mark's Eve, Catherine Baxter and Dr. Henderson arrived at the church in the doctor's sulky just as the stroke of twelve sounded on the village hall clock. All was dark and quiet, as was the small churchyard, deserted and still, their headstones showing as dark, brooding shadows seeming to hump out of the ground. The two crept to the church porch, there to wait and to watch for whatever may happen. The midnight wind blew cold from across the cemetery and swirled into the porch and about the lovers as if to warn them of what was to come, implore them to leave while they still could. Neither spoke, but only huddled together for warmth and to ward off fear. Especially the fear of what they expected, even hoped, to see. They did not have long to wait. The wind suddenly dropped. Somewhere, out in the night in the direction of the churchyard, came the long, loud squeak of the lich gate opening. And presently, through the darkness, a form, somewhat stooped came silently and with slow, measured steps along the path to the main door of the church. Huddling there, Mrs. Baxter and Dr. Henderson shrank back as it approached, a bent, shrunken thing in a grey winding sheet, gaining definition as it neared. It was old Baxter, even with the ravages of illness, death, and the effects of the doctor's potions upon his features, he was still recognizable as the aged and despised husband. The door to the church swung back of its own accord, and the corpse, 
looking neither right nor left, stalked by the pair and entered, leaving behind a sickly scent of corruption. The door closed silently behind it, and for an instant every window of the church lit with a brilliant, unearthly light. Then all was still and dark again. For a moment the two stood on the porch, too astonished to move or to speak. Then, as their senses returned, an evil glee stirred within them, conquering their fear. They embraced, kissed, and laughed together, a wicked laugh, knowing their deed would be fulfilled. Sick old man Baxter would die, and his ungrieving widow would be free to remarry, to live and be happy once more. Taking her by the hand, Dr. Henderson raced Catherine Baxter with flying steps back to the sulky and galloped away, their hearts filled with joy and dark passions. In later days, as they sat in their separate places, pondering their future, they may have regretted so hasty a departure from the church porch. If they had stayed a while longer, they might have seen two more phantasms, each in its grey winding sheet, slip through the squeaking lich gate, troop up to the church door and enter, smelling of death. They might have seen that it was themselves, their heads lolling lopsided as they stepped, the hangman's rope still close about the neck. Author's Note Watching for the Dead to Be from the Church Porch on St. Mark's Eve, April 24th, was a superstition practiced from the 17th to the late 19th centuries, mostly in northern and western European countries. All on St. Mark's Eve was suggested by an anecdote found in the Elliot O'Donnell book Ghosts with a Purpose. Like an urban myth that happened to a friend of a friend's aunt's brother-in-law's plumber, O'Donnell says the story was told to him in 1936 by a woman who had a relative back in the 1870s living in an English village where this supposedly happened. The O'Donnell piece was only a page long and served as the skeleton on which to hang a more fleshed out story. I included the strange Mrs. Salisbury, who may know more of Catherine and the doctor's plans than she's letting on, and the ending with the two broken-necked corpses. In the original, the unnamed scheming woman simply sees herself on the church porch at midnight and dies of fright. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. All right, let's get this out of the way. Um, what was this voice you were doing? <laughs> what, what? Oh, no, no, I, I know what the voice was. What possessed you to do that voice? Actually, it was Oedo T's idea. Really? Well, what possessed Oedo T to uh, suggest you do that? Uh, well, uh, apparently he'd been watching a lot of Jane Austen movies, and he thought that this fit perfectly with that kind of a thing. Uh, Are there I... a lot of roles for robots in Jane Austen films? <laughs> I remember Mr. Darcy had a very faithful android sidekick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. Uh, he was watching Emma, and he was watching uh, Ewan McGregor's performance there, and he just thought it was perfect. I don't know. I mean, I, I tried to get that kind of gossipy 19th century Elizabethan say more words kind of an idea in there, but uh, who knows? I was amused by it. Oh, I, I was amused, too. I <laughs> luckily had no part at all in the whole story, which you know I love. So <laughs> I had my mic off, but uh, you would have picked up my laughter had we not turned it on. You know, I tried to give it that gossipy thing, but I also really wanted to go for the voice that you might use if you were reading a bodice ripper type uh, <laughs> novel from that time as well. But that totally reminds me, and I, I interrupted in the middle of the story to tell you about tales of ribaldry <laughs> on Saturday Night Live back in the uh, the late 80s. And John Lovitz was the host of this. I'm assuming it was a PBS type show called Quince. And he would present these ribald tales of naughtiness. Mm. 
<laughs> he had like a powdered wig and and rouge on his cheeks and lipstick and stuff, oh, and he God. was all fey and and <laughs> so funny. And I just yeah, I kept picturing John Lovitz prancing about <laughs> while you were doing the voice. I'm sorry. All right. And I all guess right. I, I don't know what Rick was picturing when he heard that. Yeah, I hope he liked it. Uh, it's a different take. We didn't do the Australian accents or anything like that, which is probably good. And uh, I, ho- I hope he agreed with me. Um, hopefully he's not going, what the? To show my ignorance, often when I see the way that Rick writes stories, I immediately, rather than an Australian accent, imagine a British accent. Uh-huh. Partly just because of the O-U-R of color and color and, <laughs> right. and those type things. And I wonder if the story sounds wrong in his head in a faux English accent <laughs> or if we did it in our normal accents, our Yankee accents if that just rings untrue to him every once in a while on another podcast you can hear an american reading a story and it talks about uh, you know we got into the lift and <laughs> we got out of the lorry and closed the boot stepped out to watch the football match so no, it was manchester united our favorite side see that's <laughs> that just sounds totally wrong and uh, conversely let's say that you wrote a story that takes place in some small american town and then Alistair Stewart reads it over on uh, Pseudopod. Would that sound wrong or would it somehow elevate the material <laughs> as the British accent is wont to do? I don't know. It depends on how dependent on Americana the story might be, I think. If you were to take a Jason Sanford story like Maps of the Bible or something like that and hand it over to Alistair, it would really not work out. My paw had pat near had enough give it up man he'd gotten out the old belt and all right some stories like i think this one i hope it still has some sort of october scary story ring to it even though we kind of transformed it into something amusing as well i hope they're still at the end when you see the two ghosts with the rope still around their necks i hope that still has some fun spooky connotations left i hope i haven't killed it i hope you haven't either now you got me paranoid. Oh, sorry. The legend, the whole idea of the ghosts appearing on St. Mark's Eve was just great. I uh, That captivated my imagination and twisted my nipples at the same time. Whoa. Uh, you said it, 08 OT. I'm sorry, R 08 OT, do you mind uh, cutting out that just the last, the little thing? He says that's his favorite part so far, so it remains. Okay, well, thank no, 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 cut it out, the, the part about the nipple. And please cut out the part about me asking you to cut out the part about the nipple. He's going to cut something out now. He's, he's getting kind of confused. Oh, you, okay. I will uh, hope that he cuts out the part I'm saying right now. Forget it! Very, very good, you know, to whet the appetite. And I really feel like this story could have been three times longer than it was. The shortest story we've done in a long time, right? Yeah, we haven't done one like this since maybe like all the way back when we did Hangman. Or it's been a while. What was the word in Hangman? <laughs> awesome that you can remember that. <laughs> Just pulled that right out of the air or something. Uh, whose idea was it to do two stories today? You- that was Oedo T2. He's Uh-oh. full of ideas, apparently. Yeah, okay. Ask him why why he chose to do so. Was it because this one was short? Oh, okay. No, it wasn't because it was short. What he wants to know is, do, did you like the idea of having two stories? Frankly, no. I, I'm actually kind of uncomfortable with that. Well, it turns out that's exactly why he uh, chose to do so. Oh, interesting. Mission he's, successful, robot. Yeah, he's smart. I hate when we have like 15 days between episodes. <laughs> you know, if we've got a little short story, it's like, well, hooray, we can catch up. Well, we'll make you edit the uh, first story and, and I'll edit the second. How's that sound? Uh, okay. Well, That'll save some time then, right? Sure. This next story wasn't written as an October Scary Story event submission, but we thought we'd include it along together with this first story because yeah, they're both scary. This is Kevin Anderson's return to the show. I believe he's now Kevin... David. Kevin David Anderson. I think he's a serial killer now, so he had to assume that third name. Or at least a serial Doonstief story participant, author, man. Oh, please leave this part in, (laughs) Roland. Kevin Anderson did uh, Halloween in July. He did the one about mutilating fairies. (laughs) Uh, So this would be the third one, the third story then. 
Uh, actually, it's his fourth. He did a poem for us. Oh, well, thank you for reminding me, robot. Boy, he's just full of useful information today. Yes, isn't he? how about that? Okay, fourth appearance. Now, that probably is a record then. I, I bet there's nobody that's done four. That might be uh, as far as anybody's gone. Mike Stone has probably, by the time this airs, Mike Stone will have done four, right? That's possible. Cats and dogs. I'm not sure when Cats and Dogs is going to hit. Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, never mind. <laughs> yes. So <you're> up. Have... <laughs> See, this is delightful. Okay, so again, Kevin Anderson. Kevin D. Anderson, which stands for David. He is Kevin David Anderson, serial killer and assassin. Wait, author. Thank goodness the robot is editing this episode rather than me. So he brings us our next story, The Day Hypnotism Died by Kevin David Anderson. My, my, sorry, Kevin David Anderson has grown a third name in the last short while. You a may vestigial have, name. You may have heard him before on our show referred to as simply Kevin Anderson. Kevin says he doesn't care for clowns or rodents of unusual size, and I don't know that anyone actually does. Mickey Mouse is a rodent of unusual size. <laughs> he uh, hasn't made one in years, but he enjoys gravestone rubbings. He likes Elvis more than the Beatles. Blasphemy. But just a little bit. And uh, when he dreams, he is usually the monster. The Day Hypnotism Died by Kevin David Anderson. I didn't believe in them. Most people don't. We chalk it up to mentalist bunk, sleight of hand for the unconscious, only effective on the weak or feeble-minded. But disbelief can dissolve in the span of a moment when evidence to the contrary rips your friends away in a cacophony of blood and screaming. This is about just such a moment, one in which I met the greatest living hypnotist in the world. It was also the moment I lost three good friends for reasons I still don't understand. I'm not sure anyone does. So, Runt, what's this great idea you have? I had said, as the evening began, the four of us strolling toward the boardwalk. We were four nerdy, dateless high school seniors looking for action, or as close as we could get to it. Stop calling me that, James, the smallest of us said, pushing up his glasses. Russell slapped a beefy hand on my back, and I felt his enormous girth in the friendly thump. Yeah, Craig, stop calling Runt that, he chuckled, always laughing at his own comments thinking himself the next Chris Farley. James stopped and turned around, glaring. I hate it when Coach Hansen calls me that, and I sure as hell don't like it when my friends do it. James had been called runt since before I met him, so it was always a little surprising when he got pissed about it. Sorry, I said, gesturing to myself, shrugging. I'm an ass. James continued glaring, his face turning pink. Sorry, I repeated. Really? Sighing, I took a step toward him, holding my arms wide. Do you need a hug? A smile moved over James's face. Go blow an orc. I heard Russell and Alan laugh as I dropped my arms. Alan, taller than all of us, stepped forward. Okay, now that you girls have made up. He looked at James. What's this great idea? James reached into his back pocket, producing a flyer. It looked old, like some pirate's treasure map. Charred edges, faded black ink. It was all for show, but it was intriguing. He held it out so we could all read it. One night only, the greatest hypnotist in the world, south end of the fun zone. The fun zone, I said. James met my eyes with confusion, then his face flickered with understanding. Forgot, you're a newbie. It's this carnival that comes to the boardwalk every spring break? Russell said. I nodded. Any good? No, mostly kid crap, but this hypnotist thing sounds just the place for hip guys like us to make an appearance. I smiled. If we were hip, we'd have dates. Dates? Alan said. We're keeping our options open. Yeah, that's it. I nodded. Okay, Runt. I, James, lead on. 
we strolled through the fun zone, stopping only to lose some coin at the carnival games, none of us coming close to winning anything. At the south end, we saw a modest circus tent set far enough apart to make me think it wasn't associated with the carnival. Jeez, look at the line, Alan said. Hey, does that say admission 15 bucks? Russell pointed a thick finger ahead. Wow, that's steep, I said. James faced us. Come on, you tight wads. What else do you have to spend it on, girlfriends? Better be a good show, Russell said as we stepped in line. By the time we made it inside, there were no seats left. People stood along the tent walls, looking impatient. At the side of the stage, I saw a slender, red-headed woman wearing a shimmering spandex outfit and carrying more folded chairs than she could handle. I didn't hesitate. Follow me. My friends fell in line, and we were in good position when the woman began unfolding the chairs on the left side of the stage. Russell helped her place the last few, and we took our seats. She smiled at him, saying, Danke. Russell leaned over. What'd she say? My high school German had finally come in handy. She said, thank you. You think German women like big guys? Russell patted his belly. I was about to say not a chance in hell when the lights suddenly dimmed. A yellowish spotlight flickered to life, dousing the stage in a sickly hue. Stepping into the light, from where I couldn't tell, was a tall man dressed in a white tuxedo. His face was unremarkable, the kind you would forget only moments after looking away. Even today, I can't recall a single identifying feature. The only thing that lingers with me is that he seemed wrong for the moment. I got the sense that he shouldn't really be there, not with us anyway. Like an Anne Rice character, he seemed like someone merely passing through this century. Without a word or facial expression, the man began to conduct a symphony of magic tricks. Boring stuff. Rabbit out of a hat, interlocking rings, and a lousy sleight of hand card trick. Even the music was cheesy. It sounded like there was an organ grinder backstage, turning the crank without any sense of rhythm. I half expected a monkey in a fez and a matching vest to start working the crowd for pocket change. After each trick, there was some polite applause, but most just groaned. If this shit keeps up, I'm going to kill Runt, Russell whispered in my ear. Right after we get our money back, I said. Suddenly, the hypnotist bowed, still not having said a word, and the stage went dark. There was a smattering of uneasy applause, the kind you might expect after a really bad karaoke performance. In the dim light, we all glared at James. Our undersized friend seemed to shrivel even smaller under our collective disapproving gaze. The spotlight returned, with a suddenness that made me gasp. This time it was deep crimson, and the redhead from before stepped inside. She brought her hands up to her midsection, interlocking them like a ballerina, and began to speak. Her words seemed purposely slow, seemingly aware that her accent was cumbersome to understand. You may have heard that hypnotism is the power of suggestion, allowing subjects to believe what others cannot perceive. Many lay claim to these powers, sideshow frauds, preying on willing minds, degrading the art and offending the masters. She paused long enough for a few murmurs to bubble up from the audience, and then continued. What you will see tonight is real hypnotism, not the usual carnival freak show you have all come to expect. On this stage, the wall separating perception and reality will become transparent, and you will see as the hypnotist sees. Fantasy and belief will become one, and as a final act, before becoming a part of the ages, my master will remove the wall between what was once taught and what can only be imagined. This evening is the final performance of the last living master, and it should be remembered as the night hypnotism died. What the hell? Russell whispered. That was a bit dramatic, I said. The lights came up over the audience, and the woman looked out onto the crowd, her expression suddenly pleasant, as if she was a hostess at a dinner party and she had just noticed her guests. Now, for those of you that wish to become a part of a performance that will be talked about for a century, please, join me, she said, gesturing to the stage. A thin brunette woman stood up in the front row, and the redhead waved her up. Several others stood, moving toward the stage. Then... To my amazement, James stood up. He must have thought that whatever was going to happen to him on stage was less severe than what we were thinking about doing to him for dragging us in here. Then Russell stood up, 
his wide hips bumping my shoulder. What are you doing? I said. Russell shrugged. Just thought I'd get a closer look at the hypnotist's assistant. Our two friends walked up on stage as Alan and I stared at each other across two empty chairs. He tilted his head. You chicken? I narrowed my eyes. I will if you will. I rocked forward, looking as if I was about to stand up. Alan jumped to his feet. <laughs> Sucker. I sat back in my chair, arms folded. He glared at me, shoulders slumped. You suck. The redhead waved at Alan to join the others on stage. He shot me one last disapproving leer as he walked toward the spotlight. I looked up at my three friends, very pleased with myself. They stood side by side with five other volunteers, all looking anxious, excited. Russell motioned at me to join them on stage. I just shook my head, grinning. Alan cupped his hands around his lips and mouthed the word, wussy. Why, at least I think that's what he said. I silently mouthed in return, bite me. The hypnotist appeared on stage, and again I didn't notice from where. For whatever reason, his assistant did most of the talking. She asked the volunteers to focus on the hypnotist's index finger, which he raised and held out at arm's length. Without a word, he lowered and raised it over and over. He did this for a full minute, and I could feel the crowd growing restless. The thin brunette even started to giggle, but the red-headed assistant gave her a harsh glare, and she immediately stopped. After another grueling minute of this, the hypnotist lowered his hand, and as his hand descended, so did the eyelids of the volunteers. All of them. By the time the man's hand was at his side, my friend's heads were all slumped onto one shoulder. My jaw dropped. There were chortles from the crowd. Not the type spawned from a humorous situation, but the kind emitted from a large group of people that are collectively unsure how to react. The redhead looked out over the crowd, holding a finger to her smiling lips. They sleep now. Shh. Her voice was an intense whisper. No shit. I shifted in my seat. Excitement, concern, fear, and anticipation coursing through my body. I was already imagining telling this story to everyone, even though the people I most likely would tell were up on stage. The hypnotist turned to face the crowd, making a brief gesture, like a man tipping his hat to an elegant lady he chances on the street. Then, with the commanding presence of a conductor, he turned to face his subjects, instruments ready to be played. He snapped his fingers, and the volunteers awoke, their eyelids fluttering like window shades. Laughter rose from the crowd as the volunteers yawned, some even stretched as if waking from a long sleep. Alan looked at me, yawning. He shrugged his shoulders as if to say, what happened? I just returned him a grin, nodding. The crowd quieted, and my attention again fell upon the hypnotist. With poised strides, he moved over to the right of the stage, standing in front of a volunteer furthest in line from my friends. The volunteer, a man in his mid-forties, smiled as the hypnotist gazed into his eyes. I could tell that the man was uncomfortable with this. He seemed to arc backward, like a weed bending in a strong wind. The hypnotist moved in, their noses coming close to touching. He stayed there for a moment, a voyeur peeking into a window. The volunteer gazed back, his eyes never blinking. The crowd fell silent, and when the hypnotist finally pulled back to speak a single word, it resonated to all four corners of the tent. Without any hint of an accent, he said, Spider. The volunteer's eyes slammed shut, and he dropped to the floor with a thud. His round belly lay flat on the stage as his arms and legs began to spray outward, grasping for something. Then his hands and feet gripped the stage, and he pushed himself up, rising slowly like a predator searching through the grass for its next meal. His head sunk into his shoulders, and his neck just seemed to have retracted inside his body. It was horribly uncomfortable to look at, and the crowd gasped, myself included. I could hear people behind me murmur to one another. Jeez, that's incredible. How did he... Nays don't bend that way. It's just show. Volunteers are all plants. The redhead raised her hands, attempting to quiet the crowd. The rumbling stifled a bit, but continued. Then the man on all fours started to rotate, and the crowd fell still. Soon his rear end pointed at the audience, and after a brief hesitation, he started to crawl. A shiver scaled my spine as I watched him scurry across the stage, not with the motion of a being using four legs, but with the dexterity of a creature with eight. The four limbs I could see moved in tandem with four unseen limbs, and although they remained invisible, I had no doubt they were there. The back of the stage, shrouded in shadow, appeared to be the man's destination, 
and my throat went dry as he crawled to the safety of the dark. He spun around, sinking into the blackness, with just his head visibly bobbing up and down about a foot off the stage, his pupils, now black, glinted in the stage lights. I could feel his humanity slipping away as he looked back at the crowd, no longer recognizing us, and the audience no longer seeing a man. Stunned applause rose from the crowd, but the hypnotist did not stop to acknowledge this. He stepped over, standing in front of the next volunteer, a thin brunette woman. After a similar preamble, the hypnotist said, Chicken. The woman's eyes fell shut, and she hunched slightly. When they opened, her head started darting forward, her arms curled up on her sides, flapping. The hypnotist removed a handful of chicken feet from his pocket, holding it out in front of her. The woman's head darted forward, pecking at the pile in his hand. The crowd again broke out into reserved applause. The hypnotist let the feet fall to the floor, and he slapped his hands together. The woman fell to her knees, pecking at the food on the stage, as the hypnotist took a moment to glance back at the crowd. Although there was no expression on his face, I got the distinct impression that he despised us. Maybe it was in his eyes, but in that brief moment I felt absolute loathing. He turned to the next volunteer, as his assistant brought out a large wicker basket. The assistant gestured for the volunteer to step into it, which he did, smiling, as if it were something he did every day. The hypnotist peered into the man's eyes and said, King Cobra. The volunteer dropped into the basket, disappearing from view. A moment later, he began to rise, not as a man would stand up, but like a serpent ascending to the tune of a snake charmer. The hypnotist took a noticeable fast step back, as if he wanted to stay out of striking range. There was some applause, lacking enthusiasm, and growing more uneasy. My own hands lay still in my lap, unable to move. The hypnotist gave a nod to his assistant. She stepped behind the basket, its lid in her hand, and raised it over the volunteer's head. In a quick motion, she pushed the lid down, forcing the volunteer back into the basket. She wedged it in tight, then glanced at the hypnotist, who had already moved on. The next volunteer became a weasel, who immediately arched his body into an unsavory position and began grooming a very long tail, seen only by him. The hypnotist next did his thing with a petite woman who, believing herself a gazelle, leapt off the stage, bounded down the main aisle and out the entrance. A man in the crowd, a husband or boyfriend, jumped to his feet and ran out after her, calling, Linda? Linda? I looked up at my friends, who all waited patiently, as if standing in line at a public restroom. I waved at them, getting their attention. They looked down at me, perplexed, seemingly unaware of the other volunteers' metamorphosis. I motioned them to get off the stage, and before I knew it, I was on my feet, heart pounding, my gestures growing frantic. Popcorn hit me in the back, and I heard someone say, Sit down! Another volley of popcorn and something sticky at my head, so I slowly lowered back into my seat. The hypnotist stood in front of Alan, looking him up and down. He gazed into my friend's eyes and said, Monkey. Alan dropped into a squatted position, his legs tucking under his body, shrinking. He rocked forward on his knuckles and his tongue shot out over his lips. The hypnotist patted him on the head, then pointed to a thick wooded post that held up the tent's roof. Alan furrowed a simian brow then jumped off the stage, his butt inches above the ground. When he reached the post, he leapt up, and his sandals fell off his feet. I held my breath as I watched him climb the pole like someone born to it. When he neared the ceiling, he stopped, looking down. The hypnotist produced a banana from his pocket and threw it up. Alan, I swear, caught it with his foot. His goddamn foot. I could hear the audience applauding, but it was like distant background noise. The soundtrack to a movie I wished I wasn't watching. The hypnotist turned to Russell. My friend's huge frame towered over the hypnotist, but it cast no illusion about who was in control. The hypnotist leaned forward and said, Mouse! Russell dropped to the floor. I could feel the thud reverberate under my chair. His near 300-pound body seemed to shrivel, limbs retracting, fingers curling into paws. He looked at me with no recognition, nose twitching with unseen whiskers. Russell's beady eyes scanned the crowd, and it looked as if he were about to run. But just then, 
the assistant placed a large, clear plastic bowl face down on top of Russell's head. Russell froze. Laughter began to dribble up from the audience as we started to realize Russell believed himself trapped inside the bowl. Russell sniffed at the wall of his prison as the crowd clapped. The hypnotist stepped in front of James, gazing deep. James cocked his head a little as if he might be in pain, but then straightened. I know what a runt like you wants to be, the hypnotist said. It was the only sentence I heard him say. He took several steps back, giving James a large berth. Then he said, Elephant! James's head slumped forward, as if the weight of a trunk pulled it down, and he landed on all fours. The stage shook, and I could hear wood cracking. He thrashed his head from side to side, and I felt a breeze, almost as if a large set of ears were moving the air like enormous fans. James raised his head upward and bellowed so loud I covered my ears. The crowd went silent. Near James's feet, the woman, believing herself a chicken, pecked at the seeds on the stage. James stepped back, looking irritated, and brought his head up high again. I thought he was going to make that awful, inhuman sound again, but in the soft tent light filtering through the dust that wafted up from the stage, I saw an outline extending from James's face. Like an apparition, it hung there, thick, long, and ghostly. Although I recognized what it was, I still didn't believe it. It was a trunk, an elephant's trunk. James swung it downward in a horrific arch, putting his whole head and upper body into the motion. It caught the woman pecking at the stage across the midsection, lifting her up and hurling her into the air. She crashed into the back curtain, causing the man, now a spider, to scurry out of the darkness. I could hear screams behind me as I looked at the broken woman lying at the back of the stage. She wasn't moving. My eye caught the hypnotist as he stepped over to Russell, who was still trapped inside a bowl. People were knocking into me, toppling chairs as I struggled to stay where I was. The hypnotist placed a hand on top of the bowl on Russell's head and drummed his fingers. He looked out onto the pandemonium, and I saw it again, that look of contempt in his eyes. With a quick movement, he lifted the bowl, and Russell wasted no time. He darted forward, nose twitching, beady eyes scanning back and forth. Then he seemed to catch sight of the man who believed himself a weasel, and he froze. The weasel met the rodent's gaze and began to pounce. Russell retreated back toward James, the weasel in fast pursuit. The two began running around James in wide circles. James was getting upset and started rising up on his hind legs and stomping his front feet down, shaking the stage. I rushed forward, reaching out with the intention of grabbing Russell, but the mouse had scurried under one of James's front feet just as it came down. The next thing I heard was a grotesque popping, like a watermelon in a trash compactor. The crushing sound was still echoing in my ear when James raised his foot, which had just reduced the midsection of Russell's enormous girth to the width of a pizza box. James continued to stomp, transforming Russell's head into a pulpy mass of jelly. The stage began to sway, and I could hear metal tearing, wood splintering. Someone careened into my chest, spinning me around toward the tent's entrance, the only exit now clogged with bodies. Over the screaming, I could hear the canvas tearing as new exits were being created along the tent walls. Even though there seemed no point, James still brought his foot down on Russell's remains over and over again. Unable to endure the pounding, the stage collapsed with a crash so loud it momentarily drowned out the sounds of panic. The large wicker basket toppled into the seats, its lid rolling down the aisle. The man inside began to slither out. The collapsing of the stage had somehow calmed James, and I started moving toward him. I didn't know if I could snap him out of this, but I sure as hell was going to try. I approached him from the side, just behind his peripheral vision. I was about to stretch out my hands, preparing to clasp his shoulders, when I hit something. My face collided with a leathery but soft surface. I put my hands up, feeling the thick, wrinkled skin... I blinked my eyes, but could not see what my hands could feel. As my fingers slid over thick folds of warm flesh, I felt tiny sporadic hairs bending beneath my palms, and as I brushed over them, their pale outlines began to flicker into view. I stared at my hands caressing the air, watching them rise up and down slightly. Looking through my fingers at James, I realized that my hands rose up and down as James breathed. My friend looked back at me, 
his head craning around as if it swiveled on a large neck. Indifference glinted in his eyes. He turned forward and started lumbering toward the center aisle. Something caught me hard on the side, and I toppled back. Reflecting back, I can only imagine what struck me was James's unseen rear leg or hip as his elephant exterior moved by. I landed on the front row of the chairs, my head cracking against a seat. Blood trickled into my eye as I pushed myself up. My first thought was to look for James, but something else above caught my attention. High up on the tent ceiling, a man defied gravity, moving like an arachnid, clinging to the canvas. His sunken black eyes gazed down, and I swear to God, it looked as if he were trying to spin a web. A banana peel landed on my head, and I heard Alan, still high above the seats, laugh like a chimpanzee. I slapped the peel from my scalp and looked down the aisle. Wooded chairs had been reduced to splinters under James's weight. I just caught sight of him as he moved out the exit, his unseen bulk catching in the opening's aluminum frame. The metal twisted, and the entire tent shifted in the direction James was moving. I thought it would come down around me, but then he broke free, and the whole canvas room snapped back with a violent jolt. I hustled down the aisle, jumping over wreckage. When I reached the exit, I turned around, looking back at the collapsed stage. I think I wanted to get one last look at the hypnotist, the being responsible for all this chaos, try to remember his face, mark it in my mind so I could identify him later. But he and his assistant were gone. The only thing I saw was a man, now free from his basket, coiling himself around the broken, still body of the woman James had hurled through the air. Running out of the tent, I tried to force the image from my mind of the man attempting to swallow the dead woman whole. James's trail wasn't hard to pick up. I just followed the crushed cars, injured people, and the screams. By the time I had caught up to him, a county deputy was trying to block his path. The officer stood in the middle of the street, directly in front of James. People who had seen the destruction were yelling at him to move, but the young deputy stood his ground. Get out of the way! I screamed, running just behind James. I waved my arms to the side. To just move! The officer must have thought he was dealing with a drunk. But, at the last second, he must have seen something, because he went for his gun. The muzzle had just cleared the holster when James hit him. The deputy slammed to the ground, and I cringed at the familiar popping sound. He managed to scream, but it was instantly muffled as a large foot crushed the deputy's head. I tried not to look as I stepped by, but my peripheral caught one of the man's legs, still twitching, glistening crimson in the downward glow of a street lamp. I followed my friend for several blocks, watching him careen into parked cars like a cornered animal. He seemed disoriented, frightened, but never stopped moving. Hey, James. Calm down, buddy, man. Calm, calm down. James. I tried talking to him, but there just wasn't enough human there to hear me. We both turned a corner, and I saw a barricade of black and whites blocking our path. I could tell by the amount of weapons drawn that the cops were not interested in apprehending James. That boat had sailed when they lost one of their own. When he noticed the police line, James slowed for a few steps, then charged. I felt bullets cut through the air over my head before I heard them. I dropped them, covering my face. When I finally looked up, James was on his knees, shot still tearing into him. I thought they would stop shooting after James lay still on the pavement. But they kept on for a while until a burly voice yelled, Cease fire! I envisioned myself running over to James, holding him in my arms to hear his final words like they do in the movies. But when I started to get up, the same burly voice yelled, Don't move, asshole! Put your hands out where we can see them! Twenty minutes later, I was still wearing the handcuffs the owner of that burly voice, a Sheriff Kincaid, had slapped on my wrists. He questioned me in the back of a squad car, his large Stetson rubbing on the inside of the roof. How well did you know the deceased? Kincaid asked. He he was my friend, I said. We called him Runt. That was just over a year ago. I did spend some time trying to track down the hypnotist. So did Sheriff Kincaid and a few private detectives hired by relatives of the nine confirmed victims from that night. At least three others are still missing. From their pictures in the paper, I recognized them as other volunteers... And after all this time, I'm pretty sure their families, at least if they knew what I knew, would prefer that they stay missing. One of the volunteers that isn't missing is my friend Alan. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but 
I can't bring myself to visit him anymore. He's been a resident of the Riverdale County Mental Institute since that night. I stopped driving up to see him shortly after hair started to sprout all over his body. Sheriff Kincaid says he looks like something that stepped out of Planet of the Apes. Alan shares a floor at the sanitarium with a teenager who hunts rodents with the cunning of a weasel and a woman that leaps around like a gazelle. <sighs> I don't think the hypnotist's final performance will ever fade into the past for me. My nightmares keep it in the forefront of my mind, and every animal I see in the wake of that day always has some human feature that makes me wonder. Today I received a news clipping in the mail from Sheriff Kincaid. He described how he and his men were called when someone found a monster-sized cobra. It had been nesting under the boardwalk, feeding on cats, dogs, and, some think, a few missing children. How a cobra had managed to make it to the United States was still a mystery. But what concerned most were the strange appendages that ran along its underbelly. They were reported to resemble human fingers. Author's note. I went to my first hypnotist show back in the 80s, and to me the most fascinating thing is not what happens on stage, but rather the willingness of the volunteers rushing to the stage. I've never understood why people run to the stage and volunteer to become life-size marionettes in a macabre and often ridiculous puppet show. If you know anything about hypnotisms, you know that without this unbound willingness to be a character in a live version of the show Jackass, there simply is no show. Hypnotism doesn't work if you don't want it to. So why do the volunteers want it to work? The only thing I've been able to come up with is that it's about excuses. There are certain things we want to do and things we wish to experience, but need an adequate excuse to release us from those socially binding shackles that keep us from making an ass of ourselves. Excuses like, Oh, don't blame me. I was so drunk that I didn't know what I was doing. Or, Hey, I only dressed in drag because it was Halloween. Or, I only did a Justin Bieber impersonation while dancing the Macarena because I was hypnotized. If it's not about finding an excuse to uncover a side of ourselves that probably should remain hidden, then I honestly have no idea why people rush to volunteer in these shows. I just know I won't be volunteering anytime soon. And scene. The day hypnotism time. We were singing Bye bye Miss American Pie Drove my Chevy to the levee Oh, the hey, levee welcome back dry. Sorry, uh, yeah, we're back There's still six more verses <laughs> Oh, God. So that was uh, our second story today The day the hypnotism died Sorry, see, it's the hard day. not to do <laughs> The day hypnotism died By Kevin David Anderson <laughs> Okay what to say about this story? Have you ever been to one of those hypnotism shows? Have you ever been in these character shoes? I have, actually. When I was in college, my roommates and I went to more than one of these uh, hypnotism shows. And basically, it, rather than having volunteers, the hypnotist would attempt to hypnotize the entire audience. And then he would go through while we were all in a semi-under state, semi-hard state. Terrible. Uh, and pick the ones that were, the, you know, had the most cleavage. No, pick the ones that were the most under hypnosis to come up on stage and be humiliated. And then uh, what he would do is is make them dance around and embarrass themselves and then snap his fingers and they wouldn't remember what had happened. And he'd say, luckily, we have been videotaping tonight's performance. So you 15 people on the stage will have to buy one of these cassettes. <laughs> and they cost $100. Out, to find out what you have been doing and to whom and how long it took. That, that was pretty amusing. And I remember uh, one of the times I, I nearly got picked. One of the things that he would do when he tried to hypnotize the entire audience was he would have us put our hands together, our fingers interlocking, and then... As he spoke, he would say that, that I've poured glue uh, between your fingers and the glue is hardening. It's getting tighter. It's like, okay, the glue has sealed and you cannot pull your hands apart no matter how hard you try. And I did try and I couldn't get my dang fingers apart. 
And the shock of that sort of took me out of the hypnotic state. And as soon as I was out of it, my hands came apart easily. So I feel like I got the best of both worlds because I got to experience that trick of the mind that I actually couldn't remove my fingers. And yet I was able to remember it. And you still got to watch the show too. And I still have to buy the video later. (laughs) There was a corn dog up my rectum later and I didn't know how it got there. But I... uh, And all that happened just while he was hypnotizing the audience. Uh, That dude behind you though had a strange smile on his face. It's time for the hate letter of the week. That's the only experience I've had with the whole hypnotism thing. Although there was a hypnotist that came to our junior high and, uh, Gosh, doing an, an, an assembly at a junior high has to be just like the fifth <laughs> or sixth level of hell. I don't know if Dante wrote about it, but oh, junior high assemblies. The, Which there, is worse, not a though, worse junior crowd. high or elementary school assemblies? Oh, easily junior high. Yeah. Elementary, you can still threaten the children you know, to go back to their <laughs> classes or they'll miss recess or whatever. And junior high, they don't care. It's like, what are you going to do to me? But that made a very, very long story. Not at all short. How about you? What is your experience with hypnotism? I've only been to one of those shows one time, and it was a similar thing, although I was much less susceptible, I guess, to it. They did the uh, the same thing, although you just had to, like, stick your arm out in front of you. And shout, see, Kyle! (laughs) Don't go there. (laughs) He was telling you, like, your arm was being pushed down by a weight, and and then he would say, oh, now your hand is filled with air or whatever. Deutschland! (laughs) Deutschland! (laughs) Uber And if judging by how high some people people's arms went i think is how we picked who was most susceptible in the audience and grabbed those people out and yeah and then they ran around doing wacky crazy crap one thing that i thought was kind of interesting is you know at the end he's like okay i'm gonna insert you with one last hypnotic suggestion and then you go and i'll go down to your seat and then i'll say something in my closing thing and then these people would get up out of the audience and do whatever it was and one woman he's like this is fine with you right sir your boyfriend or husband or whoever you are that's out there It's like, okay, when I say this word, you're going to get up out of the audience and run up here and kiss me on the cheek. And at the start of the show, he'd said, you're only going to do things that you would do. So you don't have to worry. If you have some kind of a ingrained moral compunction against this or something like that, you probably won't do it. And it was interesting because when he said that word, this woman, instead of getting up, And running up there and actually kissing him on the cheek, she just stood up and blew him a kiss from the audience. Didn't actually do what he wanted her to do, which I thought was interesting. The guy was foiled. And then afterwards, he started peddling DVDs on how he could help you stop smoking. So I don't know if anybody bought that and saved their life from lung cancer or not. Yeah, I've always wondered just how real that crap is. You said, you know, you yourself were hypnotized enough to where you freaked yourself out into thinking that you couldn't open your hands for a second i was not really my arm was not floating in the air i I didn't get uh you had no sensation of weight at all not that much i guess i didn't try hard enough or whatever i don't know we did have in my psychology class in high school we also did a, a similar thing where they had a guest person come in and this person was like a psychologist of some sort that did hypnotism on people and if you had your parents sign a form or whatever then you could be hypnotized in front of the class and so they hypnotized some dude in my class and had him go back and remember something from his childhood and he remembered playing basketball with his friends blah blah i don't know what i think of all that kind of crap maybe people in our audience have had good experiences with it it seems to me like every time somebody's hypnotized They always remember being beaten by their parent or something like that. Maybe it would be better if those memories were still hidden or maybe not. Maybe that cures people and they're able to go on to be uh, productive citizens instead of screwed up people. I don't know. Well, I'm I'm not really sure how the whole hypnotism thing works because – If it's true that you can go into your subconscious and remember things that you've forgotten or remember details that have long since disappeared, then why don't the police use hypnotism to, you know, there's a witness and he's like, I don't, I don't remember what the license plate said. I I think there was three in it or something. Why why don't they hypnotize this guy? And he's like, oh, there it is. 087329. Or maybe it just doesn't work. Maybe they've tried it and given up because they invent things and they wind up arresting people that had nothing to do with it. I don't know. And yeah, I I think I've heard people say that about the whole repressed memory thing. You know, you go to a hypnotist and he reveals that you were bothered 
when you were three or something <laughs> like that, that, you know, that didn't actually happen. There was no bothering for want of a better <laughs> word. And so to, to me, that's kind of terrifying too. And I believe that the stuff under hypnosis isn't admissible in court. Is yeah. It? You know, if someone suggests something to you, you'll want to tell them something. And so if there's not something to be told, you may well invent something. And that might be what that comes from and what the problem is. The people, you said that the dude is peddling DVDs and stuff. Um, <laughs> there are these self-help with hypnosis CDs that you can buy. Whereas, you know, help you achieve your goals, help you quit smoking, help you stop spanking the monkey, help you find true love, help you uh -huh. work harder, help you be happy, help right. your, your lost hair okay. come back, you know, <laughs> help lose Keep, weight. Help, see if you, know, you can kind of I want to know how many things you can come up with. I'm going to start counting them. Help you with your studies. <laughs> oh, do we really have to play this game? No, we don't. Go on. I did uh, pick up a book about auto hypnosis one time, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I got my tape recorder, and and I went to like 25 minutes into the tape of just silence, and then I recorded a message for myself of you're going to do this better, and you're going to be better, and you're you know you're going to be more of a man, and you're not going to be such a baby all the time, and and uh, and recorded that, and I decided to start it playing right as I went to sleep each night. But after three nights of consecutively wetting the bed, I <laughs> sort of stopped uh, with the whole thing. So I'm not sure that that actually works. <laughs> I haven't had any actual good experiences with this thing. But, you know, some people swear by the whole hypnosis has helped me quit smoking kind of thing. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear some stories of someone who has had a real experience with it. Whether it's positive or negative. I'm not inferring that your experience was made up. Okay, good. But I think subliminal messages and hypnotism are different. Oh, I'm sorry. Was I talking about subliminal messages <laughs> all this time? Oh, ROA. Okay, I'm not talking to him. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But I have also heard that you can't hypnotize somebody into doing something that they wouldn't normally do. Uh -huh. And yet at the same time, these people make giant asses of themselves <laughs> on the stage and who, present company excluded, would get up there and do that? Who would just subject themselves to ridicule or make <laughs> chicken sounds or dance the Charleston at the Apollo? You know, it just... Maybe that is part of the uh, whole volunteering thing is they'll find those people that are extroverts enough to try and get your attention by, hey, look, my hand's going way up. Look at that. Oh, my gosh, it's straight up kind of a thing. These are the kind of people that want attention enough that they'll act nutty in front of the crowd. I don't Wait, know. so you're saying they're faking? No, not that they're faking, but they maybe show that they're the kind of person that would do that in front of... Because, you know, it does take a certain kind of person to go up there and make an ass of themselves. You've got to be a little crazy. And I know my wife, for example, would never, ever, ever, ever... Listen to this podcast? That too. She would also never be on the stage um, because, yeah, she's not the kind of person that would do that on stage. Uh, see, the thing that I think of is it, it wouldn't be like something radically crazy that you wouldn't do. You know, you go up there and act like a chicken or dance the Charleston or whatever, but you're not going to like strip down to your freaking underwear up there if they asked you. That may be one of those suggestions that just wouldn't get past the. Uh, subconscious or whatever it is i don't know I, I certainly i've never been to a venue where they have people take off their clothes darn it and yet how many times have you seen in a movie where it's like okay when you hear for the word farfig nugan you will begin to strip <laughs> and she's like see i told you they wouldn't hypnotize me and they're like well it's just because of farfig nugan here you go and my bra too so is that also just a silly I think that would just be a movie device. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I mean, it's not like I'm the greatest hypnotist ever. No, well, if somebody Although would... I did play him in the story. <laughs> did you now? <laughs> I thought we got Marcus to do his work. Why did you have to bring Paul Marcus into this? Just thought it had been a while. Wait, okay. The, you are the greatest hypnotist in the world, and you come up with the idea for the perfect murder. So you hypnotize somebody that you're trying to help stop overeating trying to into kill mr baxter going to your wife's house on a certain day when you know you'll be somewhere else performing on stage to murder her and then have no memory that he ever committed this murder is, is this maybe if you got a guy this who, is just a movie kind of that thing, is right? a movie kind of thing too but maybe if you got a guy who's already committed other murders for hire or something to do that maybe that would work i don't know 
Okay, so you go to a halfway house for <laughs> recent parolees right. that got off on a technicality for murder. And he's like, okay, which of you convicted felons has a problem biting their nails? Because I think with hypnosis, I can make you. <laughs> All right, I guess I'm just talking. I'm sorry. Uh, Kevin uh, probably doesn't appreciate this. Uh, as far as the story goes, I love, love with a capital W, oddly enough, the stories of the creepy carnival or the creepy sideshow or the, you know, the kids that get together and they decide to go to the fair and there's something not right. You know, the, the something wicked this way comes kind of thing. The, right. The, the fun house that you never go out of, the, the hall of mirrors that show you something you shouldn't see, all that stuff. And this felt like a perfect addition to that sub-genre of a carnival horror story. <laughs> we used to have this little festival for the absolute worst of the vegetables called Onion Days every Ooh, August or September. Or I love like onions. Do you really? I mean, I don't eat them whole or anything, but I don't tell them to leave them off of my hamburger like you do. Like I said, the Antichrist of the Vegetable <laughs> Kingdom. Every year at the same time, it was at the very end of summer, there would be a little carnival that would come. And, uh, you know, there would be a Ferris wheel and there would be like a, not even half-assed, like a quarter-assed <laughs> version of a roller coaster. <laughs> and like the absolute worst little spook house you ever saw. Uh, uh -huh. you know, a lot of puke rides, though. And when you oh, reach nice. a certain age, you know, like from 10 and up or something like that, those are, oh, so amazing. And, and it's funny, I, I just have this place in my heart for... Puke rides? Well, not only for puke rides, but just for those little traveling carnivals where the shoddy construction on every single one of these rides. <laughs> it's, it's just, there's always the smell of cotton candy and vomit <laughs> everywhere. Mixed together, which is an <laughs> interesting concoction. I'd never been to one of those when I was a kid. A lot wait, of that. Wait, now, didn't you go to all the sideshow carnivals <laughs> when you were in high school? Say it with me, everybody. I had sex in high school. Okay. Okay. And it was interesting, you know, we've, we talked earlier that we've had a couple of returning authors on today's show, and we've had various other returning authors throughout our history. And I was thinking, wow, this is like that other Kevin Anderson story that we had earlier on the show. And I realized, no, that was a Doug McIntyre story where there was four friends that went and did something crazy uh, that we did last year, and Kevin Anderson's was Halloween in July. But uh, I really like that whole dynamic, and obviously... I'm remembering what it was like growing up and being in a group of teenage friends that are going out and doing crazy crap and acting stupid. But yeah, I really enjoyed the, the four main characters and uh, some of their interplay that they had with each other and, and so forth. I just like that kind of thing for some reason. I don't know. And I know that you write about it a lot, too. So I guess that's why I like your stories. Well, thank you, sir. And Kevin thanks you as well by proxy. Oh. Uh, another thing that Kevin does that I try to do in my stories, but I fail at it, is uh, he has the sheriff from this story and from that pumpkin story and from Halloween in July. It's the same guy in all three stories. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Kincaid makes another appearance. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there are other stories with the character in them out there. Um, Kevin, let us know in the comments uh, if you want. In this story, Kincaid is basically a straight character. He doesn't do anything uh, un- policeman like like he did in the other two stories that where he first has uh, been out killing folks and then in halloween in july he was the one that punched the hole in the uh, pipe that was giving these people their crazy carbon monoxide induced dreams or whatever yeah, but he saw the children as well right. at the end so and to totally... me that there was always a mystery there of did the children approve of what he had done or was he the next target? And that's why he had seen the children. The world may never know. It was that Reese's Pieces, wasn't it? <laughs> Say no, what? No, no, it was the licks and the Tootsie Roll Pop. All right, so I guess that's that for this week. Thanks for uh, suffering all the way through with us. Mm -hmm. As always, you can send us a story as long as you read the submission guidelines first at uh, submissions at doonsteef.com. That's right. I'm Big Anglovich. And I'm Rish Outfield. The flames climbed high into the night to light the sacrificial rite. I saw Satan laughing with delight. The day... Wait, boys! Optimus, Optimus Prime! Prime! I'm afraid I have to declare a moratorium on these quotes at the end of each episode. It's gone on too long and it's rarely amusing. Really? I, we put so much work in. No one cares. Oh, Take it from me, Autobots. It's best to quit while you're ahead.
That doesn't sound like you, Prime. I always thought you were somebody that fought on to the end. That was the old days, before Michael Bay. All right then, uh, moratorium. Uh, I guess we'll see you later then, folks. Good night. Good job, boys. Now, transform and roll out. At the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.